his own who received his Kendall Award in 1974 when he was at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and he's now at the University of Pittsburgh. He will give a history of catalysis and surface science of the 20th century. I guess someone that with it. <laughs> yes, quite. Thank you very much, Carol, for the introduction. Uh, almost all of what we know about the details of surface chemistry and catalysis, wet or dry, has evolved in the 20th century. And, uh, uh, this is just much too broad a topic to try to cover in the detail of reserves in the time we have. So I'm going to have to try to give you a bird's eye view of. Uh, of you know, I'm going to have to try to give you a bird's eye view of the subject. The uh, uh, first slide. We have the first slide. Down.
Taylor, and his name should be coupled here with Eric Redeal, uh, gave us uh, in the first book on catalysis published in 1918, which were, was described in concepts of activated chemisorption and active centers. Uh, these two workers uh, established the Anglo-American School of Catalysis and turned out a string, a string of brilliant students such as Professors Burwell, Budard, uh, uh, Turkeyevich, and many others. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, this was a chief contribution. Emmett, and, and I'm going to have more to say about the aspects of the ammonia synthesis. <coughs> uh, he developed, together with Stephen Brunar, who was a long-standing stalwart of this division, the uses of physical absorption for the determination of morphology and surface area of the catalyst. Uh, he developed selective chemisorption techniques for metal surface areas and for uh, distinguishing between chemical and uh, structural promoters uh, by using uh, similar techniques. The post-World War II period uh, just contains too many of my good friends uh, to mention by name. Uh, but uh, I just indicated some trends that have developed during this period of time, namely the employment of tracers for establishing reaction schemes and mechanisms, measurements of catalyst properties, studies of model catalysts and model reaction systems to uh, help understand uh, the reactions of more complicated systems, the, uh, an immense amount of time has gone into the uh, development of new tools for surface analytical chemistry. <coughs> the first of these to come along was the gas-liquid chromatography techniques, which uh, gave us, a, for the first time, a uh, complete uh, description of the reaction products. And coupled with this were the uses of of pulse methods uh, to, uh, uh, for studies of chemisorption, desorption, and so forth. This, perhaps uh, a spin-off of this was temperature program desorption and the other temperature programmed uh, tools uh, which have been used uh, so effectively. The photon spectroscopy is developed in the early 50s when Bob Eichens introduced into the United States at least, the uh, use of IR spectroscopy. Today, I'd say a fair, uh, a fair fraction of all papers published in catalysis contain at least in one infrared uh, spectrum. This was followed by uh, other techniques, nuclear magnetic resonance, electron spin resonance, UV visible, Robin spectroscopy, and most recently, EXAFs, which have provided us tremendous uh, tools for examining the surfaces of catalysts, and sometimes of adsorbed phases. The electron spectroscopies uh, cannot be used in situ like the photon spectroscopies, and they're mostly used uh, under high vacuum techniques, mainly in ultra-high vacuum uh, systems where single crystals are studied. And these include LEAD, uh, XPS, SIMS, EELS, and the alphabet soup. Uh, finally, I should like to point out that analogies with homogeneous analysis and homogeneous systems can't be overlooked. Uh, there was a tremendous uh, burst of activity in organometallic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, if you like, uh, following World War II, which uh, evolved into, uh, into systems which could be understood chemically. And there's been a great uh, boost to our understanding of the mechanisms of catalysis, which has uh, come out of this. The next slide. I'm going to do it. I like to go back and review the ammonia synthesis just briefly. 
Way back in 1794, Berkeley determined the composition of what was known as tincture of heart's horn uh, as NH3. And for over a hundred years, this remained a challenge repeatedly tried by chemists to synthesize ammonia from the elements. And this work was, was noted for its lack of success. It was not until the early 1900s that that the problem dawned on Haber. And this really came about because of the developments of physical chemistry that had taken place in the prior 25 years. The work of Van Hoff on chemical equilibrium and uh, the principles of Le Chatelier and Braun had come out. And, uh, Haber reasoned that uh, he, he didn't know what the equilibrium constant for uh, ammonia was, but it, it might be very small. But since the reaction was exothermic, the equilibrium constant would decrease with temperature. And the nitrogen nitrogen bond is so strong, it requires very high uh, temperatures to dissociate it. So uh, this seemed to be a good case where maybe uh, one could substitute a catalyst for heat. And he uh, uh, did this, and uh, after a couple of years, was able to form respectable amounts of ammonia, of ammonia over uh, osmium catalysts. This he patented, sold to BSF, and uh, retired uh, to uh, a research institute to watch developments and to reap the rewards of his royalty. The, uh, this process was taken up by Bosch and Mitosh, and uh, they uh, took a very Edisonian approach. Uh, they set up a catalyst screening facility in which they uh, tested something over 25,000 different compositions of matter before they got to refine to the final catalyst. And this catalyst was kept a very high secret at the time. Uh, the, uh, in the course of this, they had to, uh, developed the catalyst recycle. This, I guess, had been introduced perhaps first by Hubbard himself. But they developed that they developed the water gas shift reaction to provide the large amounts of hydrogen that are required. And really, here was where the basic foundations of chemical engineering technology uh, were developed. It's interesting to note that uh, this uh, first plant uh, went on stream, a commercial plant went on stream in 1912. World War I started in 1914. Uh, it was a, a war that Germany would not have dared to participate in if they still had to import their nitrates from Chile, uh, as uh, because Botanica ruled weight in those days. But, uh, the, on the positive side, I might also point out that this development, coupled with the Oswald process to form nitrates, uh, has formed the basis of our fertilizer industry. And without this, there would be a large fraction of the world's population uh, going home hungry uh, every night. <coughs> well, during the war, years, uh, Taylor and Redeal uh, initiated the English-American schools of catalysis. I guess I mentioned that. But interestingly, in 1918, the triumphant uh, Allied armies overran Germany, and someone thought it might be a good idea to, to liberate a barrel of the German uh, ammonia catalyst and send it back to the United States to the fixed nitrogen laboratory. Uh, and it was thought that it would be, should be a simple method, matter, matter just to analyze this uh, thing, find out what was in it, duplicate it, and put America on stream in the ammonia synthesis. Well, it didn't work out that simply. Eight years went by uh, without getting anything near as good as the, what was in the bar. And this is when Paul Emmett was hired to set up a physical chemical group within the fixed nitrogen laboratory to investigate the 
the, the, the reasons for this. Part of these were physical, being able to get proper surface areas and so on, but they also discovered that the, 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 one of the chief things here was a very small amount, a couple percent, of potassium oxide, which uh, was in the German catalyst, that uh, uh, nobody knew about. It was not an obvious thing to analyze for by wet chemistry available in those days. And, uh, uh, but uh, it was discovered that this darn stuff covered 27% of the iron surface and uh, uh, had an immense effect on the mechanism. Well, uh, aside from this, uh, in another aspect of this work, uh, Emmett and co-workers uh, obtained some of the best uh, kinetic data that it, on, on both the ammonia synthesis and ammonia decomposition that had been available. This, these kinetics showed a, a rather peculiar pressure dependence uh, and uh, that was not explained at the time, but Temkin and Pachia offered uh, a, a, a kind of a, an explanation which was not on a microscopic scale. And so arguments went on for the next 25 years as to how this should be interpreted and interpreted. Well, the, uh, in this period of time, uh, isotopes were brought into the in system. Uh, energetics studies of the surface uh, were brought about until about 1978, Budart uh, published a paper which presented essentially the same, uh, essentially the, the picture we have of the ammonia synthesis today. It's very interesting, though, that in spite of this lack of detailed knowledge, it was uh, uh, possible to purchase, at the time this slide was made, 25 uh, uh, ammonia at $25 a ton in tank car lots. So it would just indicate the efficiency of the process. Well, uh, finally, uh, in, in, in the more recent years, the studies of single crystal faces, the ammonia, as it relates to ammonia synthesis, were introduced by first by Brill, I think, and then Samarjai and Hurdle. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this to show you how this work has amplified what was already understood. So the next slide shows a, the, uh, a study of the kidney sorption of nitrogen. The study of the three gases independently was carried out first. It was found that if you carried out your absorption at low temperatures, uh, that uh, you could do your uh, TPD uh, and everything would desorb by about 210 degrees K with the maximum about 165 degrees K. If, on the other hand, the, uh, the equilibration was carried out at 450 degrees centigrade, uh, you still got the same peak off after cooling down in nitrogen to this low temperature, but uh, you also got a second peak off, uh, which didn't desorb to about 870 degrees K. And uh, the, so that it was Given this information, it was possible to look at these two species separately. And so the, uh, the uh, low temperature species turned out to have uh, an XPS uh, binding energies, which are uh, pretty close to the molecular, <coughs> that found for, observed for molecular nitrogen. And it was uh, showing evidence that this was a molecular adsorbed species. On the other hand, the high temperature form uh, gave a single peak which uh, uh, had a lower binding energy. And this, from the lead pattern that could be obtained, uh, uh, showed uh, that this was atomic uh, nitrogen. And interestingly, it didn't matter which crystal face uh, one uh, studied. This is Hurdle's work. That, uh, where uh, 
the surface reconstructed into the C2 2 by 2 structure uh, with the nitrogen atoms sitting in the interstices between these large uh, iron atoms. Now this happens to be exactly the on a, unim on a, on a single two-dimensional plane uh, the structure of Fe4n and I can assure you from my own experience back in late 40s that given the bulk phase Fe4n it'll reduce to ammonia like a bat out of hell uh, at 100 degrees centigrade. So uh, these are uh, facts that are accumulated. Now these could, these could be attributed uh, or described if you like by this potential energy diagram. Uh, you have a, for the atomic adsorption, you have nitrogen atoms infinitely separated from the surface. They fall into this deep potential well with a stabilization energy of about 55 kilocalories per mole. If, on the other hand, you uh, uh, adsorbed uh, uh, molecular nitrogen, it would have stabilization energy of only about seven kilocalories per mole uh, in, the unpromoted, in the unpromoted case. And uh, these two uh, wells cross uh, at uh, an energy uh, higher than the, the, the separate energy. So this is provides an activation energy for uh, adsorption of, uh, of the uh, nitrogen. Now, it should be recalled at this point that Emmett, uh, one of the conclusions of the fixed nitrogen laboratory was that the rate of ammonia synthesis was just about equal to the rate of the dissociative chemisorption of nitrogen, which is pictured as this process. Now, interestingly enough, when potassium oxide was added to the surface, this increased the, uh, the heat of adsorption to about 11 and a half kilocalories for the molecular species and lowered the activation energy for formation of this species. Now, as shown on the next slide, uh, this atomic form of nitrogen does not desorb below 450 degrees centigrade so that it is uh, stable and becomes, as Udart had pointed out, the massy or the most abundant surface intermediate. Uh, on the other hand, hydrogen also desorbs dissociatively, dissociatively as the tracer experiment showed, but it can be effectively completely desorbed at 200 degrees, not under 200 degrees C. The atomic form, or the molecular form, at minus 100, and ammonia at 100 degrees, less than 100 degrees C. So uh, what you find then is that you have on this sur a surface which is reasonably saturated with this uh, atomically adsorbent stuff, which the easiest pathway for escape from the surface is not desorption, but by hydrogenation to ammonia, which can desorb readily. So this is the kind of picture that, uh, that, that emerged. Now, incidentally, if, uh, if as pointed out by Erdl, if this uh, is what's going, really what's going on, then the, the uh, uh, steady state concentration of these adsorbent uh, atoms uh, will be a function of pressure of nitrogen over the pressure of hydrogen at uh, to, to some power. In other words, the Tempkin uh, uh, kinetics can be deduced from this. So the role then of surface science as it's related to catalysis here, it gives you a superior definition for such model surfaces as uh, uh, we are dealing with here uh, uh, a, uh, a single uh, metal surface uh, that in a limited number of uh, reaction possibilities. It uh, certainly uh, provided uh, very uh, 
impressive uh, confirmation of the earlier work and the overlap of this really provided reliability and, and scientifically respectability to that all that earlier work that took something like uh, 60 or 70 years to carry out whereas this picture in surface uh, of surface science uh, took only a couple of years although it cost maybe 10 times as much to initiate the <coughs> the uh, however I, I, I think that we should uh, point out that this is not universally uh, cannot is not universally applicable uh, because uh, many systems <coughs> are not uh, amenable to these kinds of studies, these particularly oxides, sulfides, some of the more uh, important catalyst systems. OK, uh, the, I wanted to just to point out that some of the spin-offs that came out of the ammonia synthesis, uh, besides uh, the, water, the water gas ship reaction, which I mentioned previously, was developed, the oxidation to form nitrates and fertilizers. But then it didn't take the, the German workers very long to recognize that carbon monoxide and nitrogen are isoelectronic. And they reasoned that this ammonia formed this way, carbon monoxide should form methane and water. And they were right to an extent. But as early as 1912, they discovered that, that this was uh, accompanied by a whole lot of other things. And uh, uh, this seemed to be too complicated and uh, a thing to worry about during the war, so it was set aside. It was picked up again in the 1920s by Fisher and Troch and uh, uh, became known as the Fisher Troch process. The, uh, the, 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 this, uh, when I first uh, ran into it uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, this was the kind of data that we had to work with. This is all the tools we had. We had to separate products by distillation. So we could get C1 and, uh, and C2 and C3 plus C4. And then everything else was boiling point cuts. And so uh, the, there was a lot of speculation at the time as to how this wide variety of products might, have, might, might be obtained. Well, as better tools for separation came along, uh, it, uh, sorry, it evolved that uh, uh, the, every, everything could be explained by assuming that uh, growing chain of having N containing N carbon atoms could uh, add a, a, an additional carbon either at the end or the next to the end carbon the next higher species. <coughs> this was verified by uh, examining the fit uh, to uh, the carbon number distribution and also the isomer distributions. I wish I could have had more time. I could give you another talk about the same length uh, on this subject. And similarly, on the petroleum industry. Uh, so I'd like to just then close by pointing out uh, one of the earliest catalytic processing plants, one we made considerable use of when I was in Milwaukee, it is the yeast cell uh, uh, made for the for formation of beer, uh, wine, bread, and so on. And uh, it has a degree of sophistication which is almost unequal with our modern chemical refinery. And finally, uh, just to list some important but familiar everyday catalytic processes. And I only ask you, as you go home today, to think how you'd like to get along without some of these. Thank you very much. Those who have to go for lunch, please go for lunch. Those who want to ask a question, please ask a question. I share your idea of the yeast cell, but it's not all that efficient. 50% of the carbon goes off the CO2. Yes, the same thing happens with Fisher-Tropsch synthesis. 
That's, uh, that's, that's one of the big, uh, big problems that we may be faced with before we like it. In other words, going to go over to synthetic fuels and using the Fisher Trope synthesis that every carbon carbon bond you make releases out of fire. Directly or indirectly, and all that goes to the greenhouse effect. And it's very bad for the greenhouse effect. What we need is a hydrogen economy.